if we are going to navigate tomorrow, navigate relationships, we need to be anchored in the wisdom of God. We want the wisdom of God to help us make sense of all of this. And that's, that's what I want to get into. I did read something funny, and I love it. I thought I'd share it with you as a start today. Uh, God made the dog and said to the dog, uh, if you will sit on this porch and bark at everything that goes by, I will give you 20 years. The dog said, well, that's, that's way too long. I'll do it for 10. I'll give you back 10. God said, that's good. God made the monkey and said, if you will do tricks and entertain people, I'm going to give you 20 years. The monkey said, way too long. Uh, I'll do it for 10. I'll give you back 10. God said, that's good. God made the cow. Aren't you thankful for the cow? Uh, said to the cow, uh, you're going to do some hard work, and, and you're going to be needed in that hard work to support the farmer's family. And because of that, I'm going to give you 60 years. The cow said, oh, that's way too long. I'll do it for 20, and I'll give you back 40. God said, okay. Then God made man. God said to man, you will eat, you will sleep, and play. And for that, I'm going to give you 20 years. Man said, that's too short. So I'd like to take the 40 that the cow gave you, the 10 that the monkey gave you back, and the 10 that the dog gave you. God said, okay, now we get the meaning of life. First 20 years of your life, you eat, sleep, and play. The next 40, you work like crazy to support your family. See where this is going? The next 10, you do monkey tricks to keep the grandkids entertained. And the final 10, you sit on the porch and bark at everything that goes by. Making sense of life. I want you to look with me at the writings uh, of Solomon in Ecclesiastes. These, these words come right out of the gate, and they're strong and they're heavy. They are intended to jar us, to disrupt us, to make us think. Because here he is going to say that life is meaningless, but he's doing all of this so that we can make sense of life. So let's let it speak. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, says, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors, which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the st streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome. More than one can say, the eye has never had enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, even those yet to come, will not be remembered by those who follow them. Pretty heavy words. And yet the rest of the book is going to lean into this, the, to the discovery of joy, which comes from making sense of all of this. So it's very fascinating that Solomon starts this way. So let's break it down. If you have the note card, uh, you can follow with me. If you don't have one, we have team members that can give you one. If you need a note card, just raise your hand. Uh, this is the last day of the note card. Uh, going to go into the next series, and I'm not going to do this. Have you enjoyed these? Well, this is the last one. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> go Thunder. Now, we'll bring them back, but I just wanted to kind of try this in this series, and we'll, we'll look at using them again. But if you track with me on that making sense of life, number one, meaning, just write down meaning. Because when Solomon uses the word meaningless, 
In the Hebrew, that means vapor, that means mist. And what he is saying is that what you are and what you're doing, it has meaning. But making sense of life means that I don't try to find meaning in that which is temporal. The infinite meaning that God has for you and is assigned to you is not found in temporal things. Yes? So it starts helping us right, right out of the gate. Like, okay, that's going to affect my choices. That's going to affect my perspective. The next word is the word monotony. He said the sun rises and it sets. The river flows into the sea, but it's never full. The wind blows and it comes from north, south, and round and round it goes. And he, he's speaking of monotony. So here we are in a new day, but it's very similar to old days. And, and so there's just this grind. There's this routine. There's, it's just the same old, same old. And if we don't have the right perspective, the grind will get us. And Solomon is saying that when we understand life, then we live with gratitude and that breaks the impact of the grind and we start seeing the variety in all of the monotony and we can enjoy and appreciate a sunrise even though we've seen it again and again. We can enjoy the wind blowing in our faces because when we understand life, we can be fully present. And here we are in spring, and we've had spring before. Now, here in Oklahoma, we can jump right over winter, right into summer, but we are actually having spring, everybody. And so we say, well, we've had spring before, but because we're grateful people, we can live in this moment and see the flowers that are blooming, the sun, that is shining like there is a there is a newness even though there's nothing new even though that here we are same old same old the grind's not going to get us because we're going to go up with the gratitude and be content come on somebody that's making sense of life for well, all this movement but no arrival all this movement but no arrival just just the monotony and it's seeing all the gifts and the blessings of God contained within any given day so that this day is a gift. Then there's novelty because he does say there's nothing new under the sun. Now I have this phone. It's, I don't think it's the newest generation as they call it, but I remember the day that I got this back in the 90s. Anybody? <laughs> when I got this, I thought, it was the greatest thing. I, you know, I'm a young pastor and I'm going around and I would get it out cold. I would act like I was getting a call even when I wasn't. I love to flip it like I could flip it. And I would be on the phone and no one would be there, but I'd be glad because it was like $78 a second back then. I was like, thank you, Gia. Yes, yes. It was new. It was new. And he's like, you know, there are things that are new, then they get old, and then they're gone. They're new, they're old, they're gone. They're new, they're old, they're gone. I remember this great sports announcer. He was at this football stadium. He said, this is the greatest stadium in the history of football stadiums. You know who said that? Howard Cosell. And only one person knows who he is, because that's my point. <laughs> we live, and then we die, and we're gone. You know what stadium he was talking about? Pontiac Silverdome. You're like, what's that? I know, it's gone. They imploded it like 10 years ago. So what was the absolute best announced by the greatest sports announcer of the time? Now it's just, it's, it's over. So if there is nothing new, Solomon's saying, come on, let that make sense of life. And then you don't put your focus on a product. You don't put your focus on an event you live in the process of God's love and transformation in your life. I would explain it like this. In, in the movie Chariots of Fire, it was based on these two runners back in 1924. It came out in the 80s. 
and Harold Abrams lines up to run and he says, I'm gonna run in this four foot wide lane. It'll take about 10 seconds and this next 10 seconds will determine and define my entire existence. While Eric Liddell says, I'm about to run. I realize that God made me and he made me fast. And when I run, I feel the pleasure of God. Here is Eric just experiencing the goodness of God on his gifting while Harold was all about the metal, the product, the winning, the result. And, and when you are so driven in that way, you, you replace God with the gifts of God. And then you're gifting, it, you're driven because it's about the product where Eric is like, he gifted me to run. And when I am using that gift, it's not about the result. It's about the presence, the pleasure of God. Doesn't this set us free? Hey, hey, there's nothing new. So we get to appreciate the process becoming to those he saves. He gives the power to become. I'm not what I used to be. Is that your story today? But I'm not what I'm going to be. I'm in a process. Make sense of life. I take you to Psalm 139 now and listen to these profound words starting at verse 13. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. See, God knew you before he formed you. That's profound. So he says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God, our creator. God who gives us this kind of awesome truth so that we make sense of life. And so your life, like a book that has pages representing your days, leads us to this question. Who's writing our stories? And we can't just say, well, God's sovereign. He, he holds the pen. That's, no, he's given you the power of choice. And I can make choices today that will occupy the page with content that's a result of those choices. And if I make choices out of submission to God, then I walk in the ordained works that the Lord has set in motion. If I don't, then what occupies the pages of the book called My Life is the result of disobedience. So you have major influence on the story of your life. Donald Miller wrote a book called Hero on a Mission. And this Hero on a Mission is a book I would just highly recommend because he helps us understand our story. Again, the book is called Hero on a Mission. In that, he says, every movie has four characters. You have the victim. Something has happened to them or they have done something, and as a result, they feel stuck and can't get themselves out. You have a villain who is often very angry and out of that anger is on a path of revenge. You have the hero who is trying to help other people and the hero is not somebody who hasn't suffered. The hero and the villain have both suffered. They just made different choices. One is getting revenge. One is using that pain to then go and help other people out of theirs. Finally is the guide. The guide is the person who is stepping into someone else's story and saying, I, I can help you navigate from where you are to a brand new place. And he says, in a movie, it's four different people. But in life, we experience all of these within ourselves, within our own story. And often we can experience all four in one day. A victim, something happens to you. You had nothing to do with it. And it marked your life with 
something that impacted you in a deep way and you were stuck because of that or you did something. And then when you come into the gospel story and Don Miller has such a way of articulating this, therein is a choice. You didn't have a choice on what happened to you, but now you have a choice of what you're going to do with that. And the great news of the gospel to all of us is that none of us have to be a victim. There's power greater than what has happened to us. There's grace greater than what we have done. And whatever issue that has caused us to be stuck, the power of God can release us because what Jesus did on the cross allows me to be a victor, not a victim. That's good news. This doesn't make light of what you've gone through. It just says, I'm not stuck. There's hope for me. My past is not my future. This pain doesn't get to hold the pen and keep writing the coming chapters of my life. I'm going to turn to God, and by grace, there's going to be some new chapters. If I don't make that choice to turn to the grace of God, then I, the victim, I become the villain. I get bitter. I'm hurt. I don't turn it to grace. I turn it to anger, bitterness, revenge. And now I'm the villain. We've heard it forever. Hurting people hurt people. Or I can turn it to God and become the hero. Redeem that conflict in my heart. Listen, be transformed. The hero is one that's transforming. Please see this, the villain and the hero. They both have gone through stuff. It's just that the hero has said, I'm going to make a choice by God's grace to overcome. And then I want to help guide other people from dark places to new places. All four. So if I understand that life is short and I want to find my value in that which is eternal, that in the monotony, I'm not going to let the grind get me. I'm going to live and still see in high definition, the variety of God that's all around me. And even though there's nothing new, I'm going to live walking in the spirit, which is a spirit of newness. Wow. And I'm going to experience the power of that if I don't get stuck as a victim, become a villain, and be on a path that God never intended and occupy the pages of my book with brokenness and despair. I will become the hero I will be transformed. I will be the guide. Don Miller writes this. He writes this from his own story where he had created some incredible relational pain. He felt stuck in what he had done and, what, and where others were as a result of his actions. And he was in a very dark place. And his phone lit up, and it was Bob Goff. And if you're ever in a dark place and Bob calls you, that's a good day. Because those of you who know, Bob is, is known worldwide because of how much he loves Jesus and he loves people. He's the most encouraging person, the most faith-filled person. He's got this like a gift of faith in people. And no matter what they're going through, he can step in in the darkest, most broken times and, and like a Barnabas, a Barnabas be an encourager, a lifter like the, the guide. And so he stepped in like that guide in Don's life and helped him to process. And over time, through that interaction, Don got to a whole new place, to such a new place that out of that experience came this book, Hero on a Mission, where he helps clar clarify. And he says, Don says, I was the victim. I was being a villain. But through God's grace, through the mentorship of Bob Goff, I learned how to redeem that conflict, become a hero, and now here he is guiding tens of thousands. That book is, is a bestseller for years now. And just to place it in there, he, Don has become so successful that he has an entire huge space that people are invited to throughout the year to just come 
and process through their pain and get to a new place. And he guides the process. Do you see the story? Villain, victim, villain, hero, guide. I love it. That can be for you today. Do you see yourself in one of those four? Do you see some steps you need to take, some choices you need to make so that the pages of your future are filled with the grace, hope, power, and transformation of Jesus and the influence of your life for other people in all the best ways. Amen? Amen. A little side note, Bob is a huge practical joker. He loves to have fun. And so Don Miller, knowing this, thought, I'm going to do a practical joke on Bob. I've got to set it up for you. Don, uh, Bob puts his mobile phone number in every book. It's bizarre. Like, New York Times bestseller and, like, puts his phone number. And so these people by the hundreds call him every day and asking questions about Jesus and life and future. So Don says, I'm going to pay a practical joke on Bob Goff. Don lives in another state. He has this old white van. He puts a sign on the side of the van. Here it is. And, you know, as crazy as the world we live in now, it's called bird, he's at bird law. Can you sue a bird? Here it is. Yes, if a bird is bothering you, I'll sue it. And he put Bob Goff's phone number on the side of his van. So here's Don Miller in another state. And, and so he would be talking and Bob would say, man, this, Don, some strange stuff is happening. And Don said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I get these calls and people are telling me how Jesus is transforming their lives. And then I get a call and this guy goes, all right, I'm done. I want to sue these birds. How does that even happen? And he goes, Don, I don't even, I don't even know how to respond to that. It's so good. Let me give you three things to take with you today. Here we go. We're making sense of life, and because we have that clarity, let's have a vision of a better future for ourselves and others. Can you say amen? amen. Why do I put that out? Because we're not a victim. We're not victims. We can overcome. There's power to make new choices. There's grace that's greater than our past. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He will strengthen me with might by the Holy Spirit in the inner man. He's everything so that I can have a vision of a better future for myself, for my family, for those in my life. Number two, we need to be connected with a community who are committed to the same vision that's church, that's group life. Think of Mighty Oaks, veterans, first responders. God meets them in their brokenness. They're like, I'm not a victim and I'm not gonna be a villain. And now these heroes are finding God's grace and in the context of community with people committed to the same vision, they're walking in transformation and a great witness of what Jesus can do in someone's life. Number three, we need to be willing to engage and redeem every conflict that challenges the vision. This is the third one. It's the hardest. It's that choice where you come to the intersection. You can turn one way and become bitter. You can turn the other and become better. It doesn't seem like it's a choice because the feelings are raw and they're strong. But it is a choice. And by God's grace, we can make the choice to turn to being better, transformed. And that's where we redeem that conflict. We see the spirit of restoration go to work in our lives. Perhaps even a spirit of reconciliation. You may not be able to reconcile with everybody, but it wouldn't be because of your unwillingness. There are several factors that might prevent that. But you're free. You are free, and you're walking in now a testimony of how God can redeem the deepest hurt, and now you're the guide walking other people through it. So this is how Bob helped Don. This is how Don has helped so many. 
many people don't know, though, that, that Bob had the most difficult childhood, a very difficult relationship with his father, very, very, very hurtful, unbelievable pain. And here's Bob Goff, known for being the lover of God, the lover of people, the encourager, this victor. I remember Bob saying to me, he goes, when I went through that, I had a choice. What would, would I let that define me? Or by the grace of God, would I bring definition to that? What he was saying, would I stay a victim and be bitter? Or would I find grace and overcome and return good for evil and and be a help to the world. And you know the rest of that story. And it started in the smallest ways with people around him and then it grew to him going to Uganda and using his brilliance. You know, he, he made all of his money as a real estate attorney, corporate attorney. He went to Uganda where witch doctors were, were destroying children and he said, this stops. He rebuilt the Supreme Court of Uganda after the Civil War. Having rebuilt the Supreme Court, now there would be consequences to these witch doctors doing this to these kids. He oversaw the building of the prison where witch doctors would go if they were found guilty. And then many were placed in that prison. But because he was the one that orchestrated all of that, he got to say there will be one curriculum in this prison. There will be one book allowed in this prison. And it's the Bible. And then he himself would go and sit down. He, he, he does this here in the, uh, in, in the States with people on death row. Because he doesn't believe anybody is beyond the grace of God. And so he writes the book. It's not his first one. He writes Everybody Always. Here's the cover of it. And on the cover you see these colorful dots. Well, those are actually fingerprints of witch doctors who have gotten saved. That's amazing, isn't it? Now, as the worship team comes, just bring, bring the message together right there. Bob Goff, a victim of such pain that, it, that he didn't ask for, it was done to him. Could have become the villain, made a different choice, turned to the grace of God, becomes the hero, which is transforming. And now here he is guiding so many, like Don Miller, like witch doctors. I mean, Kelly and I sat with him one time. We, we were in the valley. And it blew our mind how direct, how effective, how... Po it, 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 it was the Holy Spirit in him speaking words of life. And he could be so far from that disposition, that destiny. But he made choices. And he's influenced thousands, even millions now. So I just came to encourage you today. This helps us make sense of life. Here it is. God is great. God has gifted you, and with your days, you run your race marked out for you. And it's not about the result. It's about the pleasure, the presence of God on you. It's about looking forward to the sunrise. It's about making the most of every opportunity because you're not defined by the outcome. You're defined by the one who made you, who knew you before he formed you. So you're secure, you're settled, you are content. I don't need a title. I don't need this, that. I have the affirmation that I'm the creation of God. He's with me. I don't need anything new. Those are, there's a whole lot of things that are new. It's just they'll become old and they'll be gone. I don't need anything new. I have his mercies that are new. So it puts stuff, it puts circumstances, it puts the past, the present, and the future all into perspective. It's just a mist. It's just a vapor. So while I'm here, and it's such a brief time, by the grace of God, I'm not going to be a victim or a villain. 
I'm going to be the hero that redeems the conflict, that's transformed and walks as a witness, as a help, as a guide to other people. How awesome. How liberating, how freeing. And so today, team, put those four Put those four descriptions up for me. And as you see these four, where are you? What do you need? What step do you need to take? Grace, forgiveness, power, leadership. It just makes sense. It just makes sense of life. And when I have clarity, then I'm motivated because I know how to go forward. Stand with me, everyone, with your eyes closed in the presence of God's amazing grace that's so real in this place. Please take that next step. Please take that next step today. Pray into it. If you're brand new, prayer is just, just talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus about where you are and the step you need to take. And in this, this place, grace will happen, healing will happen, encouragement, fresh faith. God, I just pray for everybody here, and we, we turn our hearts to you and just say, bring the power of these specific stages and phases so strong to us. See us bringing hearts of submission so that we actually are changed. Do it, God. Do it, God, I pray. In the name of Jesus, let there be growth. Let there be influence by your grace and by your power in this moment. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then you must start there. You must start with the one who knows you. You'll never find answers until you start with Jesus. So you gotta go to, you gotta go to the maker. You gotta have to go to the creator. So if today you say, I need Jesus, then what you do is just say right now, Lord, I ask you to forgive my sin. Jesus, I need your grace and I put my faith in you, Jesus. And Jesus will forgive you. And then you say, Jesus, you're gonna be the leader of my life. And then you will experience grace. And in that grace is the capacity for you to forgive others so that you move forward as a victor. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Man, somebody today is taking a step right now. Somebody is praying in a way that you haven't prayed before. I want you to feel free. I want you to shake off that heaviness. You're so weary you're carrying that pain, that grief, that burden, that addiction. May it be broken in Jesus' name. And may you be set free to flourish, to flourish, to flourish, to thrive. I see, I feel to say to somebody, we're in a new season. Actually, it's spring. I feel God is saying it's a new season for you. It's time to move on. It's time to move forward. It's time to grow. It's time to flourish. It's time to turn all of that difficulty into the nourishment that makes you the leader, the champion, the giant slayer that God has created you to be. I feel this. Joshua and Caleb said, we can take the land. They said, but there are giants there. And hear the wording. Joshua said, they are bread to us like the enemy was nourishment. The enemy was just gonna make them stronger. Come on, what, what the enemy set out to destroy you with, God's gonna turn it, hear it, he's turning it right now. God's gonna turn it. He's turning it right now for your good. Come on, clap your hands. There's victory in this place. Victory over our past, victory over the pain. God's turning it. And it's going to become part of your story to guide other people. Now, I want you to, here we go, capture the vision right now. See the vision of your future. See the vision of yourself in a better future. 
because you are changed by the power of God. To capture that. And because you have a vision for yourself, this is gonna influence other people. Come on, capture that vision. Across your mind has just been the movie reminding you of all the pain, reminding you that you're stuck. Oh, not today, not anymore. Here's the sequel. You are victorious. You are free. You're living in peace. You have joy again. Your personality can now be set free to be all God wanted it to be. Now your gifts can be released. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You got it? See the vision? You see it? You see it? That's vision. Without that, you perish. With that, you flourish. Vision, 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 vision. Look up at me, everybody, just sense this right now. Do you remember that app that came on the phone? Was it called Periscope? Is that what it was called? Remember that? It was like Zoom. Was it, am I saying the right word? And the Periscope, remember, like on the, sorry, it, it surfaces and you're seeing by what it's providing, you're seeing out into the future. And before Zoom, for all of that, you could go through that app, people in other states could see what you're seeing. It was called Periscope. I, I just feel that right now. You capture a vision of a future. You may be under it right now, but you're coming out. You may be beneath it right now, but you're coming up. And do you see what, how, you see what awaits you? Vision, man, I feel vision, vision, vision. God, give us vision. Hey, if you need a fresh vision for your future, just come to the altar. Say, you have spoken to me. If you need a fresh vision for your future, come to the altar right now. Team, help me out. Let's sing that as people come.